Hello, I'm Mark Royce and welcome to the first episode of my curious new podcast where in each episode I'll be looking at a different weird and wonderful subject, starting with what I think is an extremely rare variety of ghost. And that is a ghost with not one head, but two heads. A two-headed ghost. And there are not many of those in world ghostology, and certainly not in Wales, where I managed to find this story. Before I begin, I should warn you that the description as to how this ghost came to have two heads is one of the most spine-chilling descriptions of a ghost that I have ever heard. And also, all of the facts relating to this story were reported in the press at the time as being true. This is a real-life ghost story. Now, if I ask you to imagine a ghost, I think there's a pretty good chance most people would think of the stereotypical image of a person covered in a white sheet. A ghost which almost certainly has a head on top of their shoulders, or if not, uh, a shape or a bump, something with, with eye holes maybe, that would represent where a head would have been when this person was in this world. We expect our ghosts to have a head. Or at the other end of things, the idea of a ghost without a head is also quite a familiar image. I think probably the most striking one, uh, albeit it's from a work of fiction, would be the Headless Horseman from Washington Irving's Sleepy Hollow. We can all imagine that that dark horse with a ghostly rider on its back, maybe holding aloft a, a jack-o'-lantern or something in place of that head. But it's quite a strong image that, that we are familiar with, as is the more cliched image of the Cavalier. Again, this is something which has been used a lot in, in horror films, um, on adverts, possibly most recently in um, the BBC's Ghost series, where a Cavalier without its head is used for the comic effect where it you know it tries to find its head or it kicks its head about the place like a football and possibly the most famous example of all of these headless ghosts uh, certainly from a historical point of view would be Anne Boleyn the second wife of Henry VIII who was beheaded and who long after shuffling off this mortal coil is still seen wandering around her old stately homes and castles in search of this head, or maybe carrying that head. And this head is her link, in a way, to this world. The reason she has not moved on, people believe, is because she is looking for that head. She is searching for that head night after night. And this idea of ghosts without heads is something I'll be looking at in more detail on a, on a later podcast. But for now, we'll stick with the story of the ghost with two heads, which is called The Two-Headed Phantom of Abba Sachan. And it is a story that I found while researching my uh, first book of ghost stories to be published, a book called Ghosts of Wales, Accounts from the Victorian Archives. And if you'd like to know more about that book, I have spoken about it at length in a separate podcast, which will be available soon after this one. But just to repeat myself quickly, because I think it's important to give this story some, some context so you, so you sort of understand where it came from. All of the stories in that book were found from, as the title suggests, the Victorian archives. So they are all stories which were published 150, 200 years ago, in newspapers, and magazines, and periodicals in the 19th century, many of which had gone missing. And it wasn't until I went sort of rummaging around that I found some, some great stories, like, like this one about the two-headed phantom of Abba which would have gone, uh, presumably, ju just would have been just lost to time otherwise. Now, the reason I call it the two-headed phantom of Abba is is simply because that is the headline that it was given in one of the newspapers, shouting out, two-headed phantom of Abba um, And the two-headed bit is 
self-explanatory, I guess. It's because this ghost was presumed to have two heads. And the Abbasakan part relates to the place in Wales where this ghost was said to be hunting. Uh, and I love the word hunt, and I'll come back to that now. But Abbasakan, if your geography is as rubbish as mine is, um, it's it's the nearest big city to it would be Newport. Um, so it's not too far from the English border. And then you head upwards, head north from Newport, and it's about a 20-minute drive to get to Abbasakan to get to the scene of this story. Now, the two-headed phantom was said to be hunting in the vicinity of a pub called the Blue Boar Inn. And the reason I love the word hunting here is that people assume that ghosts are haunting. And I'm going to let you into a little secret here. But when um, the first edition of of Ghosts of Wales was published, uh, my editor assumed I'd made a mistake, saw the word hunting, changed it to haunting. And that is one of the mistakes in that book. That, well, there's probably lots of mistakes, but that's one of the mistakes I know about that was picked up on and was changed in the second edition or second edition onwards. So if you want to check if you've got the very first print of this book or if you've got one of the later prints, have a look for the word hunting in in uh, the Abbasakan story because it was changed to haunting in the first printing. But no, this ghost was definitely hunting, hunting in the vicinity of the Blue Boar Inn, which, incidentally, is still standing to this day in some shape or form. It's, I mean, it's, it's no longer a pub, and, and I'm assuming it's had a, a lick of paint or something since the, uh, the Victorian times, but the, the, the physical elements of, of the building are still standing, and if you did want to do some investigating and, and visit and try and pinpoint exactly where these events took place, then you, you can do so. But for the purposes of this story, it was very much a pub. And this is back in the days when having a ghost hunting or haunting your pub was not good for business. Because nowadays, a haunted pub is great. You can charge people, you know, 50 quid a night, come in, walk around in the dark, go looking for ghosts. It is a great money spinner. But back then, it wasn't. And as a result, people were not going to the pub. The women and children, it's always the women and children, isn't it? But the women and children, it it is said, would not go out after dark. And the brave Victorian men would only go out after dark if an urgent necessity compelled them. Now, an urgent necessity would have been uh, a family emergency, maybe, or something at work that had to be done. Going to the pub for a pint did not qualify as as a valid reason to be sneaking out after dark, because it was after dark that the two-headed phantom was seen. You were okay in the daytime, but as soon as the shades of night fell, that is when the two-headed phantom was said to be out and about. Now, The reason it was said to be two-headed is, by all accounts, the silhouetted shape of a body with two heads on top of it is is what people reported as seeing. And the best first-hand account that we have comes from a labourer called Dan Hartley, a local man who was working in the next village along. Now, for whatever reason, Dan Hartley was delayed going home one night. And as he walked back through the trees in the forest... On his way home to Abbasachan, he found himself in darkness. Now, Dan was faced with a pretty much two options here. He could keep going. He could persevere, get home to his nice warm bed, but possibly run the risk of encountering this two-headed phantom which was said to be haunting and hunting in Abbasachan. Or he could stop maybe find a nice spot in the forest to sleep for the night, curl up, curl up with the foxes and badgers or something, but not keep going. Now, fortunately for us, unfortunately for Dan, he decided to persevere, to keep going, and to try and make his way home. And as he did so, he came face to face with that two-headed phantom of Abba Sachen. And he screamed and he screamed and he ran as fast as his legs would carry him. And somehow he got home. He ran indoors, slammed the front door, ran upstairs, slammed the bedroom door, jumped into bed. 
And after all that excitement and exertion, somehow he managed to fall asleep. He woke up the next day and he was feeling surprisingly pretty good. He got dressed, walked outside, made his way to work, get on with his life. Or so he thought, because as he made his way to work, the full realisation dawned on him at what had happened the night before as he retraced his steps backwards, but this time in the daylight. He felt a bit faint. He steadied himself and then, bang, collapsed in a heap on the ground. Now, one of Dan's colleagues happened to be walking to work the same way, and when they saw Dan's body slumped on the ground, they helped him back to his feet, carried him back home, and they laid him down to try and revive him and to try and help him out a little bit. But Dan, when he did come around, was convinced that the end was near. He was convinced that the experience had been too much for him and he would die soon. So much so that he actually dictated his will to his friend. Um, and this is quite interesting, not, not so much from a ghostly point of view, but just um, from a, a more sort of social history point of view, uh, the, at what Dan considered to be his most valuable items, which were his pipe, his backy pouch, which was the slang for tobacco, his tobacco pouch, and a little portrait of his sweetheart, a picture of his love and his smoking gear, were the most important things in Dan's life. And he dished these out or he, he said where they should be going when he left to meet his maker. But this time around, Dan was fortunate. Dan did not die, or certainly did not die soon after this incident, and he pulled through. He was able to keep his tobacco and his picture of his sweetheart a little bit longer. And when the journalist who was covering this case went back to Abasakhan a month later to do an update, he caught up with Dan to find out what was going on. Now, Dan said to him, and, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing slightly off the top of my head, but Dan said, look, I don't believe in ghosts and goblins. It's all rubbish. But I know what I saw that night, and I don't ever want to see that thing ever again in my life. So what we have here is a man who we would call a sceptic nowadays, an unbeliever, someone who doesn't, doesn't care for any of this ghostly nonsense. But at the same time, even he can't deny what he's seen with his own eyes. Was he going mad? Was it a ghost? Did he really come face to face, or face to face to face to face, I guess it would be, <laughs> with a, with a two-headed ghost? Well, he was convinced that he had, and he did not want to see that again. Now, that's a lovely story, but the one problem is that what it doesn't do is explain what that ghost was doing running around with two heads. Well, some of the locals did have a theory, and after a bit of detective work, it does kind of add up and make sense, because there was somebody, a man, who had died not too far from the Blue Bull Inn, quite soon before that ghost made its appearance. They believed this man w was, was, was doomed to walk the earth because he had been a member of the Catholic faith and, for whatever reason, he had turned his back on the church. Now, he hadn't done anything terrible. He was not a bad person, but he had left the church. And what this meant was he could not go to heaven after dying because he was not a religious man. And yet, he hadn't done anything so terrible as to be sent down below to hell. This left him in this permanent state of limbo, destined to walk the earth forever, and that is who the local people, some of the local people, believed was the two-headed phantom of Abba Secha. Now again, that is a another lovely theory, but it still doesn't explain why this ghost had two heads. Well, there's an explanation for that as well. And I'm glad this is a podcast because this is possibly the most gruesome part of any of my ghost stories that I tell. And when I tell this in person, I use my, my, my hands to, to help illustrate this because it, 
it is quite a a, a grisly description uh, and I, you, you'll have to use your imagination again for this um, and I hope the pictures that you you visualize in your brain are not too are not too terrified but they believe the reason this ghost had two heads is that this man this man who turned his back on the catholic church was upstairs at home when he died he was upstairs in a house not far from the blue Bull inn walking along his landing but not walking carefully enough because he tripped while at the top of the stairs and he went flying down those stairs until <laughs> I, I don't know if you caught that that noise was my um first attempt at a sound effect but it, it sounded quite puny so i'm just gonna repeat that <laughs> that sound effect quickly for for full effect and so <laughs> much better <laughs> as as you might have guessed i do not have uh, a budget here for any special effects or any loud banging noise but anyway with a crash he landed at the bottom splitting his head down the middle that skull was broken in two and so this ghost did not really have two heads as such rather it was one head which had been so badly damaged that it was hanging open and so when seen at night in silhouette flapping open in the wind it looked like two heads as we now know, it was something much more horrific. Now, apologies if you are of a squirmish disposition. That is the most gruesome description, I think, in any of my stories. So if, if, you, if you're okay with that, I can promise you every other podcast is going to be a walk in the park from now on in. But that is the explanation of why this two-headed phantom had two heads now as i mentioned at the start ghosts with two heads are quite rare and that is the only one that i could find in the welsh archives and i was looking for welsh ghosts but if you know of any other two-headed ghosts out there please let me know drop me an email or contact me on social media whichever way is 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 preferred um, or any other interesting stories, be they two-headed ghosts, no-headed ghosts, or just a, a boring old one-headed ghost. Um, all stories, it, it's great to hear anything, so please get in touch. And also, any feedback as well, of course, because while I do have a rough roadmap of where I'd like this podcast to go, uh, I am also making things up as I go along. Um, and would love to know what you think about it, maybe what you'd like to hear more of, or, or less of, even as the case may be. I hope you've enjoyed listening to that story. I have a lot more on the way. Lots of ghosts of Wales, lots of folklore of Wales, lots of weird and wonderful myths and legends, and all sorts of tales from my homeland on the way. And I'm also lining up some, some rather exciting guests to, to join me on future episodes um, from from around the world this is a truly global podcast so again any suggestions or even if you'd like to volunteer yourself get in touch in all the usual ways so please do uh, subscribe however you you go about that or however you are listening to this thing just so you're alerted when these new episodes pop up and in the meantime thank you for listening Dioch and Varian. And the next time you find yourself walking to the pub alone at night after darkness has fallen and you see a figure in the distance, a silhouette in the shape of a, of a man with a head and with a second head, well, now you can follow Dan Hartley's advice, who did not believe in ghosts and goblins but ran home as fast as his legs would carry him. No star.